The language of the common people is one that we call Demotic or Demotic Egyptian language. Uh, and it is the written version of that language that we know of and that is most famous through the field of Egyptology. So hieroglyphic Egyptian is a written version of that common language of the people. And literacy is an important question, one that is debated within the scholarship, even to the present day. No rain. Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to the Narain Agarwal show. Today's episode is going to be one that's intriguing. Intriguing for you if you're a history lover. And let me tell you something. We're not going to discuss about boring things in history, but we're going to talk about Egypt, one of the most fascinating uh, lands that the world and the modern history talks about. And today I have on board a professor of mine, someone who I've been fortunate enough to learn from in Egypt. He is a classical archaeologist and has done immense field work in Egypt. He is also currently a full-time professor of archaeology at Hanover College. Welcoming my professor who's taught me a lot about Egypt, Professor Sean O'Neill on the show. Welcome Dr. O'Neill, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. I'm, I'm super excited about this because Egypt, I think, is a land and a culture uh, that we, we speak about a lot, especially the history of Egypt, the ancient history of Egypt. Uh, but there are a lot of things, minute things that we miss out, we don't know. And I think it's an interesting topic for almost everybody because it's, it's a very fascinating um, picturization we have in our head. So I'm excited to discover a little more of that with you today. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, Dr. O'Neill, let's say you have somebody who comes to you in front of you and says, tell me about ancient Egypt and the Egyptian history. How do you start off? Because there's so much to say and what kind of context and what kind of mapping mental framework do you set for a better understanding of Egypt? That's a good question. I, I do believe that Egypt, more than perhaps any other place in the world, uh, has a history and a, a cultural setting that is determined by the land and by the ideology of the people in, in perfect unison in many ways. And the land especially, uh, as I said, very uniquely in Egypt, has an impact on the way life and the conception of life develop. Remember that the land of Egypt would be desert, right, for the entire historical period, except for that one river that cuts through the land, the Nile River creating that lush valley, uh, providing for life, vegetation, everything that sustains the population there. And so we begin there, as you conceive of all life and the unfolding of human history there in Egypt. Beyond that, during the period that folks are most interested in, this period of rulership by the kings of Egypt, whom we call pharaohs, I think that highlighting the ideology and the focusing on the person of the king as not just a leader and a hero in the sight of the people, but also as an intermediary between the people and the gods of Egypt. In the religious sphere, that would be primary. And we have to start there if we're really to understand Egypt's pharaonic history, the daily life of the people, their priorities, the focal points of the culture. And, and that, as I said, is rather unique in some ways, the fusion of those two factors to such a strong degree when you consider every other part of the world. Wow, wow, that's beautiful. So, so what kind of timeline are we talking about? What years in the history when we're talking about this uh, time when the pharaohs ruled Egypt? Well, the real beginning of pharaonic rulership is, is difficult to pin down in some ways uh, because we have stories, we have legends uh, in uh, a very small amount of epigraphic evidence, that is to say, inscriptions. And 
it seems to us that uh, before there are any long dynasties of rulers, that there were kings who were established in various parts of Egypt, and that those rulers already before 3000 BC were in place. So yes, this is a very ancient history, if you were wondering, and uh, one of the most ancient uh, for which we actually have uh, records. And of course, it's the existence of documentary writing that determines whether we can speak of history or not, and it's the dividing line between that which is prehistoric and that which we call historic. So Egypt's history is uh, it's extremely ancient as these things go, and the first kings, perhaps around 32 to 3100 BC. Wow, so that's almost about 5,000 years ago that we're talking about. Yes, exactly. So, Dr. O'Neill, pyramids, when did the pyramids come into play and why do you think people are so fascinated by pyramids? What's this whole talk about the pyramids and why is it such an icon, do you think? Another great question. Uh, those pyramids that are so famous in Egypt uh, belong, generally speaking, to one of the older periods of Egyptian history, which may come as a surprise to you, given the massive scale of those impressive achievements. So those pyramids belong to what is often called the Old Kingdom period in Egypt's long pharaonic history. And the Old Kingdom, just to give you an idea, um, begins way back in the 27th century BC. So we're talking about extremely ancient structures that have captured the imagination of people around the world, uh, possibly because of their incredibly massive size. Uh, an engineering achievement that is uh, rather stunning for the period of human history uh, on a global scale. It's just um, really quite astounding. And I know that's given rise to all sorts of theories and there's still mysteries surrounding uh, the construction of those pyramids. Hopefully we'll be able to clear some of those up today yeah, or yeah. at least suggest some ways to clear those up today. But to th imagine that at this very early date, that engineering achievements on that grand scale could be achieved. I think that people who see them even in photographs or even in video are rather astounded and they become curious about these, these structures. They're, they're perfect dimensions, right, geometrically. The, uh, not just the size, but the ornamentation, the, the structures that's surrounding them and the questions about the materials that are used and how those materials could be transported to the edge of the desert uh, for the construction of these incredible monuments. All of this, I think, has contributed to their capturing the imagination of everyone, even young children around the world. I remember when I went to the Pyramid of Giza, the biggest pyramid that exists uh, with you, I was astounded. I usually, things are uh, seen on picture and when we go there, it's not as fancy as the picture shows it, but it was yeah. quite the opposite with the Pyramid of Giza because in the picture, it doesn't look as big, but when I was physically there, I was astounded at, by looking at the size. And I think even to build that in the modern world would take immense amount of resources and effort. So what was this pyramid built for and what are these pyramids built for? Are they... Uh, built to store a lot of jewels and are they hollow from inside? Is, is that what happens? What goes on inside the pyramid? What are these made for? Uh, I think that the lure and the appeal of imagining what might be inside these grand structures is one of the reasons they have captured the imagination of so many. Uh, and I hate to disappoint uh, your <laughs> listeners here who may have uh, just wonderfully imaginative schemes about what the pyramids were built for or what might be inside of them. But in all honesty, to clear up one misconception, the pyramids, each of them, and there are three at Giza, you saw, of course, the largest, the Pyramid of Cheops there on the Giza Plateau. And there are many, many other pyramids, dozens of other pyramids at other sites beyond Giza. And all of them were built for the same purpose, and that is as a funerary monument for a particular pharaoh or king of Egypt. Uh, some Pyramids of smaller scale were also built for queens of Egypt and for um, other folks in the royal family 
However, the biggest ones and the most famous ones were all built for individual kings. And again, it's very uh, sad. It's not quite as alluring or as imaginatively appealing as what many people have come up with. But what's located inside the pyramid are just some very small chambers containing very average run of the mill everyday uh, goods and uh, some foods, some uh, daily utilitarian implements that are supposed to be used by the deceased king in the afterlife or by the queen, for example, if we're talking about one of the smaller pyramids. Ultimately, the pyramids are monuments to the sun before anything else. Uh, and if you're wondering, how, well, how does the sun relate to a pyramid and how does the sun relate to the afterlife if these are really funerary monuments for the, to commemorate not just the life of the Pharaoh, but to sustain him after death? And the answer to that question relies in the Egyptian conception of the sun's passing through the underworld every night. So every night, the sun disappears below the horizon. And in the Egyptian conception, it enters the underworld. And the sun passes through the underworld through the period of time that we know as night. And every morning on the eastern horizon, the sun is reborn. It comes back into the realm of the living. And so that symbolism, that important journey, means that the sun is the ultimate representation of continual rebirth even after death. So for the Pharaoh, this monument to the sun that we call pyramids is meant to capture the rays, to reflect those rays of this most important celestial body that represents life even in the underworld. Uh, it may not be something that we think of first and foremost when we consider the pyramids, but we have to remember that all of the pyramids were originally covered with smooth whitish stone. And on one of the pyramids, the second largest at Giza, towards the very top, if you look at pictures, and you may remember because you were there in person, of course, uh, you may recall seeing some portions at the very top of the pyramid of that exterior limestone course. And that was meant, again, to capture the rays of the sun, to reflect the rays of the sun, because ultimately, any pyramid is a solar monument. I know it's not quite as sexy as, as people may have in their minds, and I'm sorry to dispel those wonderfully imaginative notions, but that's the truth. So there a pyramid is pretty much um, a Taj Mahal in some way. It's, it's for a deceased person and a fancy structure, but a little more than that uh, with the Egyptian context in mind. Um, I want to get into a little bit of the construction of the pyramid. So sure. some people are convinced that aliens built the pyramid, that it's yes. impossible for human beings at that point with the kind of engineering level we have to build the pyramids because of the sheer volume and the sheer effort and the time it would take. What's your opinion? Did aliens build the pyramid or not? <laughs> I'm actually happy that you asked me that question, uh, believe it or not if only because uh, some of what's captured the popular imagination are shows and programs on television that uh, suggest that perhaps aliens built the pyramids. Uh, and again, that, that's a wonderfully imaginative and creative, and I don't <laughs> want to uh, squash creativity. However, as an archaeologist, I can assure you that if given enough of a workforce and enough time that even at that stage in Egypt's history, yes, human beings can achieve something that impressive and something that is that mathematically precise. And yes, the pyramids are exceptionally precise in their mathematics. Uh, and moreover, the engineering achievement, the design from the outset, well, uh, thanks to earlier discoveries uh, in the realm of Egyptology, we can see a, a sort of development or evolution of pyramid construction that culminates in the massive expenditure of revenue for the Egyptian state in the construction of what you see at Giza, for example, and other sites such as Dashur. Uh, these pyramids 
would have been an incredible economic burden, again, really mainly as a testament to the ego and the hoped for grand afterlife of a single individual. So it's very tough, tough to justify it. And eventually in the old kingdom, it becomes impossible to justify. But imagine that a workforce of thousands works not just for two years or five years, but works for 25 to 30 years on this same project. Now the materials have to be transported from a great distance, but one has use of the Nile to transport all of those materials. Uh, I know many people consider the pyramids to be desert monuments, but in fact, that desert location, as you saw when you were there, is right on the edge of the Nile River Valley. And because of that, during the season of the flood in particular, one could bring all of the necessary materials right to the edge of that Nile Valley and transport them a very short distance from the water to the location of those pyramids on the Giza Plateau. The same was true for all of the pyramid sites that exist in Egypt, not just Giza, but all of the pyramid sites on the west bank of the Nile. And so imagine that we have decades to construct this and a workforce of thousands of individuals. Now, as long as we work consistently over time, it's quite amazing what can be achieved with the right design. And that's key. The, the ability of Egyptian engineers is incredibly impressive. It's uh, unprecedented globally, but is it impossible for humans at that time? No, not at all. In fact, it's quite possible given what we know about the evolution of monumental construction in Egypt. And the, and the incredible design that was attributed to a figure who becomes so mythical and so legendary that he's actually brought into the pantheon of the gods in Egypt, an individual whom we know as Imhotep. And Imhotep was credited with the first pyramid design um, implemented at a site called Saqqara, not too far from Giza in Egypt, and a site that you yourself have visited, good sir. And so... Um, because we're able to trace that and we can see the progression of pyramid construction, we know how the engineering mind worked at that time in Egypt's history. And so, yes, with enough time, enough resources and a, a sizable workforce, something as grand as that magnificent pyramid of Cheops that you saw on the Giza Plateau can be achieved. Now, exactly how the stones were put in place remains debated even to this day. There are three theories, but all of them really come down to using temporary earthworks, the building up of uh, mud and earth on a slow grade ramp, You're precisely right, um, in order to move those blocks into place from a great distance. And we don't know the exact arrangement. Was it a sort of staircase that worked around the edge of the pyramid? Was it just a, a continuous grade that worked um, in a straight line from whichever side of the pyramid you needed to, uh, to move the stone to? And so we may not know the exact mechanics, but at least we have some strong idea of the technique that was employed in order to put those blocks in place. And each of those blocks, by the way, averaged about two tons. So a standard small vehicle, perhaps. Uh, and there were, believe it or not, in the largest pyramids, close to two million such blocks put into place. Yes, I know. It's, it's truly astounding. Uh, two and yet again. Two million blocks times 2,000 tons. Two tons, 2,000 kilograms. That's correct. That's correct. Wow. So... If you can imagine having to move that many stone blocks into place, um, again, may maybe between one and a half and two million uh, such blocks in the largest pyramids, this is what was achieved by those Egyptians. And again, when you see the numbers, when you uh, look at the measurements of the pyramid, you think, how could human beings without modern construction technology achieve something like this? And yet, uh, again, given enough time, uh, enough uh, resources from the Egyptian state put into the project, and of course a massive workforce, I would suggest that it can be done, and it was done. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating and almost inspiring. You know, when you really think that, okay, it was human beings that built it, 
and not just some fancy aliens that came down and built it for us. That, that's an inspiring story for us as human beings as well. Uh, to I agree. Listen to. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Uh, so Dr. O'Neill, a little bit about the, the, the religious or the spiritual thought process of Egypt at those times. What was the thought process? You touched a little bit about the underworld, but um, in general, how would you set that religious and spiritual uh, belief system and framework for us? Okay, yes, it's a, it's a very large topic, of course, that you're asking about, but to, to summarize it into its essential portions, uh, religion in Egypt was the, the main driving force, the primary driving force in Egyptian life, and even obedience to this king of Egypt was tied uh, inherently to the nature of e the Egyptian religious conception. You can't separate the two. And so uh, obedience to the king and to the officials of the king in the realm of government, the surplus that uh, you try to create from the land of the Nile as you work to sustain your family and your community, it's, it's all tied together. And so the work that one does even each day is tied to the realm of the gods and to Egyptian religion. If you're wondering how obedience to the king and his officials tie into this, let's start there. It relates again to this interesting view that the king is the one person in the mortal realm who can intercede for the rest of us as mortals in the realm of the gods. And that's because of the idea that uh, upon becoming king, the king represents the incarnation of one of the gods of Egypt. Um, and you, you, those of you who have seen Egyptian hieroglyphs or, or Egyptian uh, wall painting might recognize this god. This is the god called Horus, who uh, has an interesting anthropomorphic form uh, which also has a zoomorphic component, and that is the head of a hawk placed on the body of a man. So the, this falcon, really, this, this falcon-headed god, uh, Horus, becomes the pharaoh uh, when the pharaoh is finally declared king. So as Horus on earth, this king can go back and forth between the realm of the gods and intercede for us. And so it's very important that we are obedient to the king, to all of the officials of the king, because our needs can only be met when this king intercedes for us. Now, we don't expect to see this happen. We don't expect to see the king rise up somehow uh, into the realm of the gods. It happens because the priests of Egypt in the temples of Egypt tell us that it's happening and represent it in permanent media, such as inscription on stone walls. In the Egyptian conception, to display something occurring in a permanent medium, such as stone, means that it is actually happening in the spiritual realm, which is very different from the way uh, folks in the Western world, for example, conceive of images, even images related to religious or spiritual ideology. And so, the priests of Egypt, in many ways, determine the conception of not just obedience to the gods, but even obedience to governmental figures and, and people who are officials of the king. The temples of Egypt are interesting structures and institutions in relation to this religious conception because the priests are the ones who are allowed to interact with the images of the gods who are supposed to represent the gods themselves. The temples of Egypt are not places of gathering for worship for the common people. Mm. As, a, as a common Egyptian, I would not be allowed to enter into the precinct of the temple. I would be banned from that. Uh, again, that's a special realm only for people who are priests and priestesses within that religious conception and that religious sphere. So wow. what must I do? I must submit my needs and bring my prayers to the outsides of the temples, to the exterior of shrines, and during certain festival days, when the priests and priestesses will parade the image of the god outside of the temple. This will allow me to submit my petitions and allow me to make direct prayers and entreaties to those gods. Otherwise, it's, it's very strange. It's, it's not a 
uh, spiritual realm that's based on a personal connection otherwise. It's one in which I must work through intermediaries and it's one that necessitates that I do create a bit of a surplus within my own produce, within my own economic sphere so that I can bring that surplus to the temple in order to propitiate, uh, in order to appease the gods and by giving to the temples, which of course now are very important economic structures within the Egyptian world, I must support those temples. It's my duty to, to bring my surplus, to provide finished goods, to provide, um, econo- to provide agricultural produce to sustain, and it may be redistributed among members of the clergy, that is to say priests and priestesses, but it also may be redistributed to other individuals throughout the community not in my, not according to my own determination, but according to the determination of the folks in the temple. And again, this is one of the reasons why those temples are extraordinarily important economic uh, institutions hmm. within ancient Egyptian society. Wow, that's 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 a, an amazing um, explanation, I would say, and very different and eye-opening for us. So, what would be the end-all, be-all objective? for a person to be religious and listen to the priests. For example, um, let's say talking about Buddhism, you know, the ultimate goal is Nirvana or a lot of the Abrahamic faiths, the ultimate goal is to be in heaven. So what would that be in the Egyptian uh, context back in the day? Another excellent question. And from what we can gather, thanks to not just sources within the temple sites themselves, but also even some evidence from writing uh, much later than the, than the uh, Old Kingdom period and, and the Middle Kingdom period, uh, but still perhaps reflecting in a conception that has its roots in those earliest periods of pharaonic history. What we recognize is that what people are striving for is a happy afterlife, which can only be achieved through the cleaning of your heart as a human being as you live your life, through proper obedience to the gods, and through the correct proper signs of not just obedience to the Pharaoh, but also um, to honoring the gods appropriately. So if you have done this, then you'll have the chance upon your judgment in entering the outskirts of the underworld to either go into a place that at least affords the opportunity for a happy afterlife or being sent down uh, to the equivalent of what one might consider hell um, in the Judeo-Christian scheme. And so that judgment is the first step and, and having a happy result in that judgment through, again, through unburdening your heart, through proper obedience, through proper appeals to the gods throughout your lifetime. That's just the first step. In order to maintain that happy afterlife for all eternity, one needs to rely on your family members, your relatives, and not just from your own generation, but from future generations, unless you're fortunate enough to be able to afford the commissioning of the sort of final resting place that allows for inscription in stone. Uh, a very expensive medium that's afforded only to the elites, ultimately, in Egyptian society. Otherwise, in order to be happy in the afterlife, I need to have descendants and and contemporary family members who care enough about me to bring the appropriate offerings for sustenance of my soul, my life force, in the underworld. Otherwise, I will wither away even in the afterlife. Wow, that I, seems like I, putting a lot of dependence on, on future generations that you have no control over. That must be stressful. Oh, I'm sure it, I'm sure it is. And I'm not sure uh, how one could be entirely confident that all future generations would be able to sustain you in this way. Uh, and yet, uh, this is something that, as we can reconstruct the Egyptian conception of the afterlife, that this is, this is something that is a crucial component of their conception of the afterlife. And... It has some parallels or at least some very similar aspects to uh, certain uh, cultures that have existed in Eastern and Southern Asia. Uh, But the Egyptian conception 
has some unique aspects, including, again, a particular range of offerings that need to be brought from generation to generation. And I so suppose that one of the motivating factors then is that you would want to lead a life that is worth honoring and that somehow uh, within the family traditions would inspire people, inspire those descendants to remember you and to honor you in that way, because without that honoring in future generations, I can't sustain myself. I will wither away even if I have passed that first judgment as I enter the underworld. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, another question I have that, bring, that comes to my mind is, who are some of the most important gods? For example, in, in the Indian understanding, in the ancient uh, Vedic understanding of things, there are multiple gods for, for some people, right? But then there are some important gods. But um, for Egypt, who would be uh, the more important gods and what do they control? That's a good question. And uh, to some extent, that question has the same answer for all periods of Egyptian religious history. And in other aspects and in other ways, um, that, that might be different. There might be a different answer. But the easiest way to approach this is to say that for most of Egypt's religious history, that... Um, the divine family triad of Osiris, uh, Isis, and Horus would be the prime deities in the Egyptian religious sphere. Uh, Osiris's primary realm of control is the underworld itself. And obviously, since as Egyptians, as ancient Egyptians, were very concerned with the afterlife, uh, Osiris is an important deity. Um, his consort, his wife, Isis, is also crucially important, and there are numerous temples devoted in, solely in her name uh, throughout Egypt's religious history, especially as we progress through history and we arrive in the so-called late period and the period of rulership by foreign kings, such as Greco-Macedonian kings and queens, whom we call the Ptolemies, and under, during the Roman period. Isis becomes so important during the Roman period, uh, that she is worshipped outside of Egypt at temples devoted again in her name throughout the Roman Empire, which uh, many folks find to be surprising because she is, of course, an Egyptian goddess in her birth, not a Roman deity, not one of the, the members of the Greek pantheon, certainly. And so many folks find it extremely surprising that Isis would be worshipped so widely. And in fact, in peninsular Italy, where of course the capital of the Roman Empire is located, the worship of Isis became so popular and so dominant that the Roman authorities become worried, actually, huh. that, that, that some of the local state religion is being overshadowed by the worship of Isis. And there's an edict that is issued by the Roman Senate that bans the worship huh. of Isis in Italy. Yes. Uh -huh. So it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, so Isis becomes a dominant uh, goddess, a dominant deity. And then Horus, we've already mentioned the crucial aspect of Horus in relation to pharaonic rulership. The kingship in Egypt is inherently joined with the figure of Horus. And so because of the influence of the king and the officials of the king in daily life, I think that we must include Horus in that list of the most important deities in the entire Egyptian realm. Wow, so that's almost like the Egyptian trinity in some sense. <laughs> yes, it is in, in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, what language did the people speak and uh, communicate in? And was, was a written communication very common between folks or was it only the elite and the top class priests who did it? Um, let, let's learn a little more about the language and, and the communication back in the day in Egypt. Absolutely. Uh, the... Language of the common people is one that we call demotic or demotic Egyptian language. Uh, and it is the written version of that language that we know of and that is most famous through the field of Egyptology. So hieroglyphic Egyptian is a written version of that common language of the people. And literacy is an important question, one that is debated um, within the scholarship, even to the present day. Uh, and it's one that, it's a debate that certainly won't be resolved anytime soon, but we at least have some idea that in the earliest phases of pharaonic history, 
that the ability to write and even the ability to read is the exclusive preserve of really a, a small percentage of the population. And the ability to write in hieroglyphic Egyptian is so exclusive that it's only certain members of the priesthood um, who appear able to write in that way. And so uh, early on, this most famous writing scheme, again, is held by just a few people in the employ of the temples and a few perhaps in, in the um, royal service as well, working for the king directly. Now, as time progresses, literacy does expand uh, within the Egyptian population. And there's a point in Egypt's history when we can use writings on a material known as papyrus, a reed that grows there in Egypt and which in fact, uh, a, a plant that gives us our own word paper in the English language. Papyrus was the writing material of not just Egypt, but the entire ancient world for, for many centuries. And so you, tracking that evidence, we're able to make some conclusions about the expansion of literacy. The Demotic Egyptian language had a writing system that comes to be known through papyrus that is distinct from the Egyptian hieroglyphs that we see used in the setting of the Egyptian temples. Remember that it is by and large the same language that we're talking about, simply uh, distinct writing systems ultimately. Okay. And so as we trace this and our evidence becomes much, much more extensive in the so-called late period of Pharaonic history, the Ptolemaic period when Egypt was ruled by Greco-Macedonian kings and queens, and especially throughout the Roman period, that we can see that this language does evolve as all languages do, but uh, also uh, a language that becomes much more accessible to the common people in its written form. Uh, the ability to read, therefore, becomes uh, much more widely propagated. And at the same time, as these foreign rulers come in, we see that education in other languages, especially the Greek language, mm -hmm. also becomes uh, something that is spread like wildfire throughout the Egyptian land. And although we can conclude that it is still a minority of the population that is able to read and write, uh, the numbers have come quite a long way from those earliest periods in Egypt's long history. Wow, wow, wow. That's, that's really cool. And uh, how the written language, the language remained the same, but the writing became different. That's, that's quite uh, an intriguing thing that happened. Dr. O'Neill, I want to talk about this. A lot of people, if I ask them, name one ruler, one king from the Egyptian times, ancient Egyptian times, they would say Tutankhamen. You know, mm -hmm. King Tutankhamen seems like the word everybody knows. And um, it, there's almost a projection like he was this grand ruler uh, who ruled Egypt and he's one of the most famous guys. But I know there's a myth around it. So let's break that myth. Who is King Tutankhamen and why is he famous? An excellent question. And again, I hate to uh, dispel the great romantic and imaginative notions surrounding the famous King Tut, right? Whose proper name, as you already mentioned, is Tutankhamun. Uh, King Tut is only famous because of the tomb that was discovered containing his remains and his burial goods uh, in 1922 by an archaeologist named Howard Carter. Why was this such an exceptional discovery? Why is it that this put Tutankhamun's name on the map, so to speak, and spread it around the world so quickly? And the answer to that question is that the king uh, whose tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, in an unrobbed state, in a pristine state of preservation, and in fact, the only royal tomb, even to this day, that was discovered without any robbery of the grave goods, the rich grave goods that were interred with him in the Valley of the Kings, is this interesting uh, pharaoh, Tutankhamun, who was a very minor pharaoh ultimately. And again, I hate to dispel the grand romantic notions of King Tut, the famous King Tut, but he died at an incredibly young age. He was only 19 years old when he died. Uh, he didn't really achieve anything in Egyptian, uh, in the military sphere. Uh, had he lived longer, perhaps that would have happened. But um, he, he didn't 
uh, make any grand changes within Egyptian society uh, in terms of organization. No, this boy king is so famous and is a, a, a name that's recognized around the entire planet because his tomb was discovered in this very well-preserved state. Uh, it was an amazing discovery made back in 1922, but it's one that uh, perhaps gave great notoriety to a king who would otherwise be unknown to, oh, 99.9% uh, .9 of the population. It's, uh, it's funny because there are uh, pharaohs who were much more long-lived, who achieved so much, and who uh, certainly are, are well-recorded within the annals of Egyptian history. Individuals such as Seti I and Ramses II, we can only imagine what would have been in their tombs in the Valley of the Kings. But in Tutankhamun's tomb, the finds were, were so astounding. What were some uh, of the finds? Uh, oh my goodness, the, uh, the range of finished products, very well preserved too, by the way, in materials that don't otherwise survive in other parts of the world. Uh, materials uh, and objects made uh, of wood, and we even have uh, leather, we have feathers that are preserved in Tutankhamun's tomb. But the reason why uh, people were so astounded isn't the preservation of these materials that archaeologists otherwise lack in these ancient contexts. It's the wealth of semi-precious stones and precious metals. It's, it's the wealth of the gold, the silver, the electrum, the uh, stones that had to be imported from places as far away as Afghanistan. That is what truly amazes people who are able to see the remains in the, in the tomb of King Tutankhamun, King Tut, so to speak. And all of those are visible on the second floor of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So we are able to see those if we are willing to visit Egypt. And you yourself have had that privilege, of course. And uh, we can only imagine, given the amazing wealth that was found interred with King Tut, King Tutankhamun, we can only imagine what might have been in the tombs of pharaohs such as Seti I or Ramses II. It, it's almost impossible to conceive of, given how wealthy the interred goods with King Tutankhamun happened to be in that wonderfully preserved tomb that was discovered by Howard Carter uh, almost a century ago. Wow, so it's really his tomb that made him famous. And it's almost intriguing and um, mind-blowing for me to think that a king so insignificant in the grand scheme of uh, Egyptian history, if his tomb had all that wealth that fills up the whole second floor of the Egyptian museum at Cairo, whew, the whole valley filled with tombs of multiple kings, including the ones that you mentioned, how much wealth would have been there? What's happened to all that wealth? Why have all the tombs uh, not found any wealth when the archaeologists went there? What do you think? Another excellent question. And the reason is that the contemporary Egyptians knew just how much wealth had been placed in those tombs. And even folks in later generation from the same uh, period of time. And we're talking about the phase of Egypt's history that's often referred to as the New Kingdom period, uh, which lasts from the, uh, about the 16th century BC until the 11th century BC. And already at this time, there are folks who take great pains, in spite of the risk of uh, a penalty of death, to break into these tombs by digging tunnels from the opposite side of the, the hills that create the Valley of the Kings to uh, get access to these chambers. And even though uh, the priest took great pains to protect them and, and put in a great effort to protect them, already in New Kingdom Egypt, they weren't able to. And then as we consider later periods for the tombs that may have been preserved, as we consider uh, the following intermediate period, as we consider the late, so-called late period, as we consider the Ptolemaic era, knowing that that wealth was there, put those tombs constantly at risk. And by the Roman period, we're, we're rather certain that all of the tombs that were known among the Egyptians were already robbed. Uh, the only thing that protected poor King Tutankhamun, this boy king, this relatively minor pharaoh, was that the entrance to his tomb had been covered over because 
the folks who robbed the tombs of Ramses the Sixth and Ramses the Ninth, located uh, in the hills above that of Tutankhamun, the backfill as they unburied that the entrances to those two tombs covered over the relatively low entrance point to the tomb of Tutankhamun, and it protected it for all of those intervening centuries and millennia. Otherwise, I'm quite certain that the tomb of Tutankhamun would have been robbed as well, just like those others. Wow, that's, that's really a strike of luck in the history and the scheme of things, especially for an archaeologist, I feel like, because in 1922, when you go to the Valley of Kings and you see everything is robbed, I mean, it, it must take immense amount of luck to find that spot that takes you and reopens a whole history in front of your eyes. That's amazing. Yes. Would you like I to agree. comment a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, Howard Carter had worked for several years in the Valley of the Kings. And it was interesting because he had a wonderful theory, a wonderful idea. Um, based on the much later King's lists that provide us much of the re our reconstruction of Egyptian pharaonic history, those King's lists come from much later eras, such as the Ptolemaic era and the Roman era. But working back from those King's lists, he looked at the New Kingdom period and he saw that every pharaonic ruler had been accounted for in the known remains of these robbed out tombs, except for one. And that one was a, a pharaoh with the name Tutankhamun. He had been born Tutankhaten because he was the son of King Akhenaten, who had uh, changed the capital of Egypt and changed the entire religious uh, structure of Egypt for one generation, a single generation, in which uh, worship was 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 displaced exclusively on the worship of the sun disk, which is to say, uh, Aten the life providing, uh, eternally renewing sun. Now, that's interesting because Tutankhaten, as the son of this man, was born into a religious world that the long-standing priests of Egypt considered to be heretical. Uh, it was heresy. It went against the entire structure of Egyptian religion otherwise. So when Akhenaten died, the priests of the traditional religion were eager to eliminate this, this entire view of Egypt's religion. So here's the boy king, a son of the previous pharaoh, Akhenaten, who now dies at a young age and who is buried in this uh, tomb in the Valley of the Kings, yes, to honor his role as pharaoh, but only after he had agreed to change his name to not to honor Aten, but to honor Amun, who is a deity I didn't mention earlier, but who becomes down in the south of Egypt and ultimately then through the entire nation of Egypt. A absolutely essential deity in this later period. And I mentioned earlier that as we progress through time, this question of who the most important deities uh, of the Egyptian pantheon might be, as we enter into the New Kingdom period, I think that we must say something about the primacy of Amun and his wife Mut and uh, their son Khonsu. So the, we have another triad, another trinity, if you will, that's located in a, in a center of uh, worship that is located exactly on the opposite side of the river from the Valley of the Kings in this area known as Thebes. And so now we have this boy king who has changed his name and who has then been buried along with the other pharaohs who honored Amun in this Valley of the Kings. He doesn't have a prime location for his tomb. Um, he, his tomb is smaller than many of the rest and yet filled to the, to the brim in, in what seems to be a very hasty way, as it was discovered by Howard Carter, with so many artifacts from that contemporary generation. So what has happened? Some people theorize that this Tutankhamun was buried in a tomb that had so many artifacts so tightly compressed within it and so hastily installed because the priests of Amun wanted to get rid of this trace of this worship of Aten, this heretical part of the religion. So now he's given this location. Again, this very small tomb, this low-lying tomb, difficult to access. 
And now because, as you noted, because of just the interesting passage of time, the way things uh, were were robbed in antiquity and the backfill from this earlier sequence of theft, this thievery that happened as early as the New Kingdom period itself, allows for this tomb to be very well hidden. And poor Howard Carter, who has a theory that Tutankhamun's tomb is somewhere there, who has worked for three solid years now looking for the tomb of this minor pharaoh on the verge of having his funding pulled from his sponsor in England, has a last ditch effort. And it comes to him that maybe, just maybe, a low lying tomb that had its entrance covered over perhaps in these earliest eras because of the activity and the theft that he knew had already happened in antiquity. He starts working in the vicinity of the tombs of Ramses VI and Ramses IX, as I mentioned earlier. And lo and behold, within a month of having his funding pulled, he finds something that had not been seen for millennia, and that was an untouched royal seal on a doorway at the entrance to one of these tombs in the Valley wow. of the Kings. And the rest, as they say, is archaeological history. That's an amazing story. That's an amazing story. Dr. O'Neill, it's been, it's been a pleasure to hear about all this. I have a final question for you. What got you into archaeology? And why is archaeology so fascinating for you? What stories, what learnings can we get? And how can we live better lives by that's learning archaeology? Yeah. That's a wonderful question. And it, for me personally, uh, what drew me to archaeology was a fascination that I never grew out of at a young age with uh, material that was made by human hands in past generations. I, I was always astounded what uh, earlier generations could achieve, even without the technological uh, advantages that we have in our own society. And so as I, as I progressed through time, even from a young age, I, I was interested in this and, you know, would dig things up in the backyard of my house um, and, and be fascinated by them. But I never grew out of that fascination. I carried it with me as I went off to university already um, at the age of 17. And as I, as I went and I considered taking classes in this field, I found that I loved the material more and more as I learned more about it. And, and I saw some value in it uh, for us as human beings, and of course, ultimately, as archaeologists, we are anthropologists. We, we are people who are studying humankind, ultimately. We simply do it through the lens of what's called material culture, the, these, these objects and these materials that have been fashioned or transported or otherwise uh, worked by human hands so that we can learn about human culture and society and even about our own uh, thoughts and our own ways of conceiving of the world around us as human beings. So. I happened to focus on a field called classical archaeology at first, and that's the study of ancient Rome and ancient Greece and all of these uh, cultures that bordered the Mediterranean Sea. And so I, I worked very hard as an undergraduate to be worthy of going to graduate school because I knew it was something I wanted to pursue an advanced degree in. So I was fortunate enough to be uh, granted admission into a very good graduate school, and I continued to study classical archaeology, but I also expanded my repertoire and, and began studying uh, the archaeology of the Bronze Age in the Aegean and other portions of the Mediterranean world. And already as an undergraduate, I became very interested in the archaeology of Egypt, and so I was able to pursue that a, a bit more in my studies as well. And Ultimately, it led me to a, a career in which I could specialize in the material culture of the provincial world of the Roman Empire, but particularly Egypt, which is where my doctoral research was focused and where much of my field work has been focused in the years since that time. And I've always seen great value in learning from the interaction with the world around us in these past human cultures and, and societies. I, I've had the, the privilege of being able to study several different cultures from various parts of the world. And like most anthropologists, I, I try to look at the commonalities and what joins us and unites us as human beings, uh, not just geographically, but also chronologically through all periods of time. And archaeology is a, a wonderful lens, I think, to help us to view 
those common aspects of the human experience, to be able to see how we interact with the world around us, the way in which we, we strive to, to make our lives better, how sometimes those efforts backfire, and how sometimes one step forward is two steps backwards, but also how we uh, can develop a, a balance sometimes, or how an imbalance between our own lives and the world around us can make us suffer. There's so many valuable lessons for us to learn from the past. And I've always uh, lived by the credo that if we don't learn from the past, that we're doomed to repeat all of the mistakes of the past. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a theme that I wish that I could spread more widely because I feel that perhaps uh, there's only a minority of us in our own contemporary world that actually agree with and abide by that philosophy. But uh, you can't focus on, on the numbers. One must strive to uphold those ideals nonetheless and to think that there's still many people out there who are willing to learn about the past, who are ready to learn about the past, and even more who have yet to be converted to an appreciation of what the past has to teach us about ourselves as human beings in the present age. Wow, you're definitely somebody who inspires us and intrigues us uh, about the past and I'm sure some people will get converted into into the philosophy that you just mentioned so thank you once again Dr. Neil this has been an amazing um, learning and a refresher for me as well I look forward to maybe having another conversation with you in the future about the Greco-Roman age and the Greco-Roman history but that's for another time thanks very much once again for being on the show you're very welcome and thank you Mr. Narain I appreciate it <laughs>